well first Holmes was born Then he got fat, bald, and tired, tired, tired Sup, Holmes? Beware your host, Jonathan Oh, And it never gets old. It's just an arcade character screaming at me in a gravelly voice. And Jane Jensen, you are on the show this week. That is so exciting. Yep, here I am. We met <laughs> once before. I've been trying to get you on the show for months. I've been so excited about it. And so many of the people who have been on the show in the past, in particular, a lot of the video game developers that uh, have come into prominence have named you as one of their biggest influences. Uh, Aaron... Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Erin Robinson. I don't know if you've ever met her. She made a game called Gravity Ghost. Before that, she was making games uh -huh. very much based on the stuff that she played growing up that you had made. Uh, so she's probably in the audience somewhere, if we're lucky. Um, yes, you are a big name. It is very exciting. Thank you for being on the show. Well, you're welcome. I don't do this sort of live uh, chat very often, so it's fun to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a lucky break. So for people that don't know, you have been writing adventure games and video games in general for for a long time. You you started in the industry, if uh, if I remember correctly, in the in the eighties, in the late eighties. Uh, were video games something that you were interested in up until then? It was it kind of it was such a different time then. Not as many people thought, well, I want to grow up to develop video games. They didn't have Jane Jensen's to look up to back then, so. <laughs> there wasn't the same generation, but uh, yeah, what what motivated you to get into video games in the first place? Well, I really wasn't into computers until I got to college, and then I decided to major in it um, just because I wanted a career that would be a solid moneymaker. And you know, this was I graduated from college in '83, um, so mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty early on. You know, we trained on Hewlett Packard mainframe computers with um, you know their their native language SPL and uh, I worked for them for about six years doing uh, networking drivers and really boring shit like that. <laughs> and um, <laughs> about it was uh, it was like like 1989, I think. Um, I bought my first PC from Hewlett Packard, and employee purchase price was like five thousand dollars <laughs> because <laughs> retail was like ten thousand dollars. It was one what? of what? And this is when gas cost like thirty cents a gallon or something. This is <laughs> yeah, this yeah, is amazing. Wow. Um, so anyway, I bought my first PC and uh, I went out to the mall to the gaming store and I picked up King's Quest IV and Space Hunter San Francisco. And uh, before that, the only games I had played were, you know, like Dungeon on, you know, on the computer where you just, you know, wander around. There's at signs and pound signs and things like that. Sure. Um, so I just, I fell in love so hard with that uh, King's Quest IV and, and Space Art uh, was um, Manhunter San Francisco. Oh, right. So I, you know, at the time I was, like I said, I was an engineer full time and I really wanted to be a novelist. So I was writing this novel on the side and I sent it to an agent and she's like, no, this isn't strong enough to interest anybody. And I was just crushed. So uh, anyway, after I discovered Sierra Games, I bought them all and I started playing them all. And I wrote them a letter saying, please let me work for you. I'll do programming. I'll do QA. I'll do writing. You know, I'll do whatever you want. And I sent them a... A short story with it and didn't hear back and like a year later I got a call from a guy who was setting up uh, a writer's block there and he had found my resume and short story in the pile and he had read started reading the short story and he got to the end of it and the last page was missing and it really pissed him off <laughs> he's like suddenly I, I realized that if I was that angry that I couldn't finish the story then it was a really good story so they called me and I went to interview and I just, you know, it, it didn't matter that I would be making half as much as I was making at Hewlett Packard. I just quit and that was it. There was no, no hesitation. Ah, wow. And and your first game there was, was it Police Quest 3? Actually, you know, originally I was hired into, the writer's block initially was, was to help some of the designers like Al and Jim Walls and Roberta uh, write dialogue and the documentation for the game and things like that. Um, and so I did that for a little while. I, I did like the dialogue and documentation on Police Quest 3, I think it was, with Jim uh, Walls. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the creative director at the time, Bill Davis, had an idea for a game that he wanted to do. And so he picked myself and another writer in the writer's block, Gano Hain, to basically design it for him. It was EcoQuest, first EcoQuest Search for Cetus. Right. So that was the first game I designed. And then after that, uh, Roberta wanted to do another King's Quest. And she typically worked with 
another writer because you know she was semi-retired and didn't really want to be in the office every day. So um, I was given the chance to work with her on that on that game, which was really a privilege. Yeah, absolutely. Back to to EcoQuest though. What was it like to be given the task of creating this whole world? And I'd imagine a lot of responsibility involved with that, uh, but maybe not as much as today. One of the things I find most interesting thinking about how games were back then is that there wasn't necessarily, uh, from what I know, millions of dollars involved, but but I wasn't there, so maybe there was. Uh, how much risk did you feel like was uh, put upon you that you had to take in making sure EcoQuest was a success? Well, I really didn't feel you know, that responsible for that particular project because, you know, we were kind of basically, you know, handed the idea and handed the characters and, you know, the, the creative director really had a strong feeling of what he wanted the game to be like. And so um, it was more his pet project and, you know, so I had a little bit of a lower level uh, designer job on it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I definitely felt that pressure with Gabriel Knight, which was, I mean, King's Quest, everyone knew, was, you know, it was a Roberta game and it was going to do great. Uh, Gabriel Knight, there was a lot of pressure on uh, that having that game be a success. Yeah, that's, uh, we, I was going to get to that in a bit, but we should pick it up now. Gabriel Knight was, from what I know, your your first creation where you were really the, the full creative head on it. Um, it. Actually, for those that don't know, if you could tell us a little bit about Gabriel Knight. Well, the first game came out in, I think, 1993, and it was unusual at the time because up until then, uh, you know, the main adventure games were done by Sierra and LucasArts, and all of them had been more humorous and cutesier, like, uh, you know, King's Quest was sort of based on fairy tales, uh, Legion Suit Larry was, you know, a humorous game, Space Quest was very humorous, um, you know, Monkey Island, all those games were, you know, the, that was sort of the thing then was that everything was just this funny cartoony stuff and um, so when I proposed Gabriel Knight uh, you know Ken was like well you know I, I just wish you had thought something up, else up because this is really people don't want to be depressed and upset when they play computer games you know they want to they want to have a break from real life they want to have fun and I really doubted myself after he said that but I was a huge fan of graphic novels like Sandman and um, you know, Hellblazer, and I knew there was a great audience for this kind of more gothic, uh, darker stuff. And so Gabriel Knight was really, I think, the first to be, um, to come out in the genre being, you know, a, a basically a sort of a paranormal horror mystery uh, game. Right. It's a, a game about someone, Gabriel Knight, who ends up, and stop me if I'm wrong, because I'm talking to the person who made it up, why am I talking about it at all? Uh, investigating things that end up it reminds me of the, when I was watching the, the Johnny Depp movie, I think it's called The Seventh Sign. I was yeah. like, this is just a Gabriel Knight movie, except not quite as good. <laughs> uh, that, that's uh, for people who don't know. It's, uh, so you, it starts off very much grounded in a sense of the real world, but someone who's interested in the idea that there could be stuff beyond what we see on the surface and then ends up finding out some pretty, some pretty terrifying things at times. It, it certainly gave me... Uh, some nightmares uh, when I first played it years ago now. So was was that one of your goals, was to make people feel somewhat unsettled with uh, Gabriel Knight? Yeah, I mean, I, I did want it to be scary. You know, if you look at it now, it seems sort of ridiculous because it's these little pixels, you know. Um, it's hard to believe that, but, you know, and it's it's funny because we're remaking it, and um, we, we've, we've passed some of the, the screenshots past some real hardcore fans, and they're like, this isn't... This is you know, this is so fancy, but it doesn't have the mood and the, and the darkness and the scariness of the first game. I look at the shot and it's like blue pixels, you know. And you're going, that was just in your head, you know. Sure, like, sure, sure. Well, but, that um, was that was a time in in games where we were used to having to do most of the work for us. It was oftentimes yeah. like reading a horror comic about stick figures, but if it was yeah. done well enough, it it still made us feel terribly uncomfortable. So. Great job on that. And you are remaking Gabriel Knight. People should definitely keep an eye out on that. It's a remake of the first game, is that right? Yeah. Yep, Sins of the Fathers, uh, which is set in New Orleans, I, I, and uh, it involves voodoo, so it just was a lot of fun. It's a great story to um, to have been able to work on, and I love that. I just love that setting and that vibe. 
you know, I was a huge fan of Angel Heart, the movie with, um, you know, the guy I can't, the name, whose name I can't think of. Oh, Mickey I should Rourke. know this too. Mickey Work. Oh, that's right. That's right. What an interesting career he's had. Yeah, yeah. 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 So is that one of the influences for Gabriel Knight? Yeah, that and uh, what's the other one with the guy who went to uh, Haiti? The yeah, the, Serpent in the Rainbow. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. With Bill Pullman, I think that was John yeah. Carpenter. Very creepy movie. Yeah. I love John Carpenter. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Huh? He uh, was working on making video games for a little bit, but unfortunately, kind of tapered out. Sounds like he had a real passion for it too. So you're given Gabriel Knight the first time around, anyway. And uh, how did you end up if if uh, your if whoever's higher up was a little bit had trepidation about it? How did you end up pushing through that and, and getting the project greenlit anyway? Well, that was really I think one of the strongest things about Sierra and about Ken Williams is he was really a believer in a creative vision. Um, so he didn't, you know, he really didn't screw around with the designers. I mean, once, you know, whether it was Roberta or Al or, you know, Lori and Corey Cole or, or myself or whoever, I mean, once they had a vision for it, he was, he just let them go. And, you know, he, he was, he would say, you know, I, I'm going to let you run with it, you know, for a game. And if it doesn't sell, then you're done, you know, but I'm not going to fuck with it, you know, while you're making it. Cause I don't know, I'm not a designer, you know, and that was, <sighs> You know, it's really unusual to find that sort of attitude now. I mean, you know, most companies, everybody has to get their fingers in the pie and, you know, marketing has to have a say and, you know, PR has to have a say and it has to have this latest buzzword. And oh, sure. So I, I think that was really a great thing about Sierra is they really did support um, sort of an author's vision. But if you, if that game had bombed, do you think that would have been the end of you and Sierra right there? Yeah. Whoa. So it's still... Still, incredibly high high pressure. Um, is that because uh, the the amount of money that Sierra would have lost if the game didn't do well would have been so high that they couldn't take the risk on you again? I I, I don't know how much the uh, the first Gabriel Knight cost to make if it was a huge risky venture. How that how that worked? Um, you know, I think it was about a million dollar budget. You know, and that would include you know overhead and you know marketing, you know, some things like that. So, sure. but that was about what they ran then, which is you know kind of amazing because you know we did Mobius for under four hundred thousand um, dollars. Really? Because that's that's what we got on Kickstarter, and <laughs> you know, I mean, when I say that, I mean it's actually cost a lot more. But we we put it in cash, and also the dev team took some back end instead of upfront money. So um, you know, I'm sure it is at least a million dollar project. But anyway, not to get off track. Um, no, no, very interesting. No, it, was, it was yeah. very, it was very, you know, that year that we did Gabriel Nine, I was just obsessed, and I was there all the time, and um, you know, I I you know, I just had a really big passion and ambition to be um, a successful designer, and I knew that was my shot, so, you know. Sure, and you were writing the script, you were doing the the, the puzzle design, the, the whole scenario, uh, everything on that game? Yeah, and I was also a director. I mean, at that time at Sierra, they would have, you know, like the writer, the designer, and then the director, and the director could, you know, like on EcoQuest, I wasn't the director. That was Bill Davis. So on Gabriel Knight, I was also the, the director. So basically the final creative authority that approved the art and the music and um, cast the voices and all of that. Wow, that's that's incredible. Um, following in the in the footsteps of Roberta, I would imagine, uh, did she have any advice for you at the time? Were you still talking with her at that point? Well, I learned a lot from her when we worked on King's Quest together, actually. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned from that process was, you know, because on King's Quest VI, uh, you know, she and I she and I were co-designers on it, but of course she had ultimate authority and, and she wasn't there every day, but she would get a build and she would take a week to play through it. I mean, just like so detailed and just write up. We'd get like 50 pages of comments, you know. Well, on this screen, you know, about three quarters of the way down on the right, there's a p purple pixel, and it's really distracting because it makes me think it's something I'm supposed to pick up. So please paint that out. And, you know, I mean, just like that level of detail on every single thing. And um, and I thought it was great. I mean, I, it really actually taught me how to be a director, you know, to be really very, very detail-oriented. And, and, you know, ultimately it doesn't 
matter so much if you're right or you're wrong or if it's important to anybody else but you. But, you know, the whole point is that that was a Roberta Williams game, you know, mm -hmm. and it had a certain feel that fans expected it to have. And so, you know, that was just a great lesson for me on, on uh, you know, just really following my gut and making sure things are, you know, the way that I feel they should be and, you know, if, again, you know, right or wrong, you can't really sort of second guess yourself all the time. You just have to say, well, I know that by the time this ships, it's going to be a really good game as far sure. as I'm concerned. You know, to me, it's going to be a great game and hopefully people that like my games in the past will will see what they saw in this game again. Absolutely. Being a director is so much, it's like being a surgeon really, but you're operating on like an entire world that you've made and you've got to make those snap decisions uh, from what I've gathered anyway and, and can't second guess yourself or else you'll end up uh, potentially turning the whole project backwards and, and breaking it down. So, ha! Huh. And uh, how many women were there in the industry at that time? Did you feel like you stood out? Uh, you had Roberta, of course, but, but other than that, when I look back, and, and from what I can tell, the industry was still pretty male-dominated back then. Uh, did you find that to be the case? Well, that's another way in which Sierra was really, really a unique, uh, I want to say, melting pot or, you know, sort of primordial, primordial ooze, I guess, um, in terms of what came out of that. But, I mean, if you even think about Telltale, I, I mean, not Telltale, but uh, LucasArts, sorry. Sure. I don't think LucasArts had any female designers, but Sierra was really heavily female designers, and they had, Roberta Williams was probably their number one designer. There was uh, Lori Cole, who worked with her husband, Corey, on the Hero Quest series. Um, and there was uh, Christy Marks, who did the, the Robin Hood and the um, Knights of Camelot, or the Camelot uh, games. So it, it wasn't that unusual, really. I mean, there was probably, a, a, you know, with myself, there was, there was at least as many female designers as males there. So it was a, it was a unique opportunity, you know, I think for women trying to become designers now, it's probably really challenging in some of the environments to, um, to get that opportunity. Oh, sure. And do you think that was more or less unique to Sierra, or do you think that was just kind of the way the industry was? It wasn't quite as set in terms of gender standards and whatnot because video games were, were in a different place and they hadn't become these kind of boy toy things that they, they later were seen as by the greater culture. Was it a little bit of both, maybe? I think it has... Honestly, I think it had to do with the, the nature of adventure games. Um, and it's similar, you know, in the casual game industry now, because I, I was in the casual game industry for about eight years. And, um, you know, there you could say, look, guys, you know, the market for hidden object is 80% female and they're 35 and plus, you know, look at me, <laughs> okay? So don't tell me how to design this game or, you know, like I know what I'm doing, you know, this, I'm the kind of person who should be designing this game. You know, and that's that's the casual industry. The casual gaming industry is really heavily female, so it makes more sense for female designers to be there. And if if somebody really wanted to um, to get into designing, I would recommend that they they try some to um, to go with a casual company like that, like Big Fish or Zynga or um, some of those people. But adventure games are similar in that I think you know adventure games always have been more about story and exploring and environments and characters and those you know, that type of gameplay is just more female friendly, both, um, you know, to the audience and for designers. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, I grew up on those games and I didn't know any women who played them, but it, it was more because I knew like three people with a computer and I just kind of rotated <laughs> going to all their houses because they were so expensive back then. But it, it would stand to reason that um, we market things that are about breaking things more or less to boys and we market things that... Uh, are about going places and doing things, uh, hopefully to both to both genders, and that's what um, that's what your game. Sierra's really market about. was very was very. Um, I think Sierra's audience was more men, just because more men had were into the whole PC. You know, the PC thing was very much a hobbyist sort of thing at that time, and um, but I just think adventure games have that you know that potential or that appeal to be a cross-gender sort of game. Sure, sure, sure. And I was 
really sad when they started to lose prominence and they were getting harder and harder to find. Not that shortly after Gabriel Knight came out, if I remember correctly. That was kind of the... Yeah, you came out at such a perfect time in a way because that's when people were looking... You know, you had your first generation of people who had been playing video games for 15, 20 years. They'd grown up with them, so they were looking for more adult games, looking for games that uh, didn't just kind of hand you action on the surface or, or comedy on the surface. They are about taking you a little bit deeper. But it was also right around the time that it just seemed like horror games about shooting zombies and whatnot uh, ate into the adventure market. At least that's how I saw it. So... Um, Maybe we could back it up a little bit. Gabriel Knight comes out. How did that do? It did great. It was a really, you know, I mean, it, uh, critically it did great. Um, we we showed it, I think it was E3, um, which would have been in the summer, and it was coming out at Christmas. And we handed out the first chapter on, like, you know, the little <laughs> three-and-a-half-inch discs. Um and that was a great marketing tool because people just loved it. And we got a lot of previews. We got a couple of magazine covers. Um, PC Gamer was always a really big supporter of us back then. And, uh, yeah, it did, it did really, really well. And it was clear that people just liked it because it was different and because it was scarier and, you know, not the usual adventure game fair. That's fantastic. That led to the sequel which came out two years later? 95. Right, right, right. Uh, and that was called... Oh, I'm blanking on it. Oh, embarrassing. Gabriel <laughs> Knight, and you can tell me. Please help me. Peace within. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Which was... Um, had a lot of advancements. Uh, was keeping up with the tech very well. Um, how was it working on that game? Was there a lot in terms of uh, worrying about sophomore slump, being concerned about living up to the expectations that had been set by the first game? Um, I think there was less thought about that at the time as much as it was just a challenge of the technology that we were using because we were doing live action video. Right. And, uh, you know, we were out, the script was just so crazily ambitious for, for doing something like that. Um, you know, this kind of this thing at, at Sierra where Roberta always got, like, the biggest new thing, right? Like, I think she her game was the first... I think King's Quest VI, actually, was the first game to use voice actors. Mm -hmm. And I, it was Robbie Benson who played <laughs> Alexander. Um, and, then all, and then everyone else's games started using voiceover. Well, similarly, her Phantasmagoria was the first game Seer ever did to use full motion video. And so I was starting to design The Beast Within at that point, and Ken said, it's got to be FMV because that's the way everything is going, and you know it's just like just like now. I mean, you know, once you know, once marketing and and you know the management decided this was the next wave of technology, then they wanted the games to have that because you don't want to spend a million dollar budget and have something come out that feels dated and old right away, right? Sure. So you're always trying to stay ahead of the curve. So at that point, it was FMV. Everything had to be FMV. And so I went to the studio and saw a little bit of Phantasmagoria being filmed, trying to get a feeling for it. And, uh, you know, I was lucky that way in that, you know, Roberta always kind of had to test the waters and figure out the tech. And then I could come along afterwards and, like, you know, it was already in place so I could try to focus on content more. Um, but, you know, that game was crazy. I mean, we, you know, it was set in Germany and we had wolves and horses and snow and, you know, climbing outside windows and just crazy shit, you know, a full a live opera, um, <laughs> you know, with a yeah. chandelier. and I have to go back and play this. I, I the uh, stuff that we got away with, I mean, the, the fact that we actually pulled it off is really, I think about that, and it's just like, we were insane, you know. I mean, <laughs> we had a script that was like 900 pages or something, and so the, wow. the guy who was doing the, who was directing the, the live action, they had to film like 30 pages a day or something crazy like that. It was, it was just... Um, <laughs> it was crazy. Incredible. How did it feel to be on the cusp of this change where video games and movies, at least I, I remember being there as a consumer, I thought, well, now video games are going to be movies. It's only going to yep. be a couple years from now that I'm going to the movie theater with a controller in my hand. They're going to 
fully merge together because this expand uh, expanded uh, storage system CD-ROM allows us to to live the future. It was such a but to be on the creative end of that, did you feel like things were moving in a direction where you might end up being in the next Steven Spielberg sort yeah, of situation? Yeah, I mean, it was really ex exciting. I mean, you know, everyone thought, my God, you know, we're going to be working, you know, next year I'll be working with, you know, Brad Pitt or, who, you know, whoever, <laughs> you know. And I'll sure. be famous as, you know, Steven Spielberg or whatever. But, of course, that never happened. Um, but, nope. I mean, yeah, it was really exciting, and I think, for myself and in all of the actors that were involved and the people you know the director and the people will binder who was the director on the film portion you know we we were really ambitious about it you know we really thought we were sort of I say setting history but making history sure, um, sure. but you know we, we we did we took it very seriously we weren't you know we weren't making you know a silly video game we were really trying to do a, a drama a major drama Absolutely. And was the budget, did the budget have to expand a lot in order to allow for the uh, the live action, just the, the enhanced scope in general? Yeah, I mean, it was probably more around 1.8 or 2 by the time it was all said and done. Huh. Even with all those actors, that's still relatively... You know, that that's the thing. I mean, like when we did the voices for Gabriel 1, you know, because it was one of the very first games to do voices, we got amazing actors for dirt cheap because, you know, they all kind of wanted to be in this new thing, right? I mean, we had Tim Curry and Mark Hamill and, you know, just Ephraim Zimbalus Jr. and like crazy people on that. And they did it for basically scale because it was this exciting new thing. And it was the same thing with Beast Within. I mean, a lot of the actors, you know, they they really worked for Peanuts just because it was this exciting new thing. And, um, but, oh, How yeah. wonderful. I'm trying to, uh, it's just so fun to picture myself in that situation. And did you end up, were you part of the casting for Mark Hamill and Tim Curry on Gabriel One? I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, uh, we worked with a, direct, a voice director in L.A., Stu Rosen, who was a great guy, and um, he would send me ca casting tapes. And uh, the hardest people to cast were Gabriel and Grace. Um, we actually had a Grace that we had hired that I was there at her first session and it just wasn't working. And so uh, we had to let her go and look for somebody else. But, um, yeah, so he he knew all these people because he does tons of voiceover in LA. So he knew all the all the actors that did voiceover, and and he helped to uh, to get them cast. But we got to review the tapes and choose our picks for it. That's awesome. What uh, what did what made you choose Tim Curry and Mark Hamill out of all the other choices you might have had? <laughs> well, uh, I we listened. I listened to a bunch of Gabriel Knight auditions, and I just wasn't feeling it because. He was a difficult character because he, he had a very snarky, um, he was very snarky and he was very much a womanizer, you know, sort of a big flirt. But, you know, I didn't want him to be obnoxious, you know. Uh, he had to still be really likable. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, a lot of the auditions that we had were either, you know, he just sounded like a jerk, you know, and an asshole that nobody would like playing, you know, or he didn't have the, he just couldn't get the snark. So, uh, Stu suggested, you know, I, I, have done work with Tim Curry before, you know, because at that point Tim did a lot of voiceover work and he did um, audiobooks and some things like that. So, what do you think about that? And I was like, well, I mean, he's a great, great personality wise, but he's British, you know, how is that going to work? This guy's supposed to be from Louisiana. He's like, well, let me try it. So, he got Tim to audition for it and it was just like perfect, you know, so yeah. That's a, yeah, what a, what a story. Do you keep up with Tim Curry now? You guys like send each other emails? <laughs> No, no, I wish. That's too bad. Yeah, he's had an interesting arc in his career. But I got too. to meet him on uh, Gabriel 1, and then he was also the voice of Gabriel on Gabriel 3. Oh, right, right, right. So Gabriel 2 was FMV, um, but Gabriel 3 was not. Am I remembering that correctly? It was real-time 3D. Oh, right, 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 polygon-based. So how did Gabriel 2 do in terms of sales? Great. Yeah. It did really well, and... Um, huh. It was probably the one, I mean, you know, PC Gamer had in the back of the magazine, like a basically reader's choice list of things, and it, it was like the number one adventure game for probably four or five years, uh, Beast Within. And, and people always tell me it's their favorite of the Gabriel Knight series. Hmm. Um, 
That's wonderful. And that the leading into Gabriel 3, if I were in your shoes, I would feel like, you know, I've established something that would be hard to take away from, from me at this point, that this is going to stick around. So going into Gabriel 3, how did you feel uh, moving forward? And, and was it your idea to use polygon-based graphics, or was this another thing where you kind of had to just keep up with the tech regardless if you wanted to or not? Yeah, I mean, I was sad to let go of FMV because... You know, we had gotten, I'd gotten very attached to the actors and, um, you know, it had been so, so popular, so successful. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, you know, there was actually a pause, I think, of at least a year. And we weren't sure that Sierra was going to do GK3 because that was about the time when um, the Williams sold Sierra to a French company, I think Pendant at that point. Um, and, you know, adventure games were sort of already on the way out. And um, everything was was uh, real time 3D shooters and action games coming on strong, and so it was kind of a question of whether or not there would even be another Gabriel Knight. And then Roberta did one last King's Quest, and it was uh, it was done in real time 3D, and it was had action sequences in it, and it really wasn't successful. I mean, people didn't like that, you know, mm -hmm. that move. Sure. Um, sure. So they finally decided to go ahead and do Gabriel 3, but it was it was a long production. I mean, I think we were in production for about three years. Um, Oof, wow. Yeah, that's so um, much kind of rug and There wasn't a lot of, um, you know, I would say, you know, there's a lot of overturn on the team. And, you know, Sierra at that time, uh, we had moved up to Seattle, and, you know, there just wasn't, it just didn't feel the same. It wasn't, you know, the people that worked there weren't very enthusiastic about adventure games. And, mm -hmm. um, man. This is sort yeah. of a lack of direction, I think. Sure, sounds sounds painful. Like you wanted it, you wanted to continue it, but the the energy and the and the the sense of vision as to where things could go with the adventure game genre in general had been kind of knocked away. Well, what, what do you make of that? Why do you think adventure games started to fade out during that time? Uh, I I wanted them to continue, and I was personally uh, sad to see them dying out and sad to see them changing to try to keep up with the times i was i was perfectly satisfied as it was but but uh, but the market shifted what do you what do you make of that shift why do you think it happened well i have my pet theory um <laughs> i don't know how, know how accurate it is but you know when we, i think it was, was working on gabriel one or something we had you know there would frequently be people coming through the halls at sierra that were touring taking tours and this group came through and they were they were the makers of this new game called Doom, and they were trying to sell it to Ken. And, you know, I remember them showing it to me on the laptop, and I'm like, wow, that is really amazing, because it was like the first time I'd seen sort of just like going through these tunnels in real-time 3D. Sure. And, um, I mean, that was sort of like the hole in the dike, you know, because, uh, I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but I think what happened was when PCs were still you know, in, the, in early days, they were they had a very slow processor, so they really couldn't play action or arcade games. So the games that you could play on a PC were the slower games, like puzzle games, word games, adventure games. And then, you know, if you wanted to play action games, you had to go to the mall, right, and go to the arcade. Sure. Um, so what, what, basically what happened is PC processors just kept getting faster and faster and faster. And by the time when they could actually play a game like Doom, I mean, it was basically all over for the slow games because that was like the hip new thing, you know, and everybody wanted that because that was the new and exciting. And, you know, if I could go around and shoot things, why do I want to, you know, play Princess Rosella? You know, I mean, um, and sure. I think, you know, the, again, and two, like once those games were really on the PC, then the people that wanted to be on the PCs were more, you know, the, the younger guys who wanted to play those kinds of games. So it just sort of... Um, it just changed the whole industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's more than that pet theory. That sounds like a brilliant observation to me. Being there at the time, I didn't have the, the perspective to see it that way, but I remember first playing Doom and hearing people talk about it and people buying computers just for Wolfenstein and Doom and that sort of thing. But it's still, uh, it's sad. It, maybe I should get over it because it was so long ago. But I'm still kind of <laughs> sad to think about how um, there was a, a games made for uh, women or both genders on PC, and those slowly 
or maybe not so slowly. They they pretty quickly got edged out uh, to a point where I wasn't seeing games like that at all. Do you think that that women just moved on from computer games because the uh, the market wasn't speaking to them in the same way? Why do you think they didn't stick around and, and demand uh, more adventure games and less action games at the time? I don't think the audience, there were that many um, women playing at that point. You know, I mean, when I was at Sierra, um, you know, a lot of the fan mail I got, got was from guys. And in fact, we sold, um, you know, typically the Sierra games would sell, you know, like, maybe 150,000 units in the U.S. and then another 150 overseas. So a lot of my fan, fan base actually is European guys. Mm. For some reason, I don't want to say they're more intelligent <laughs> than American guys. <laughs> it's a different culture, but, um, different it standards. Is. I mean, it, yeah. you know, there's more, you know, interest in literature and I don't know what, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think the audience then was still more male just because, again, PCs were sort of hobbyist machines at that time and they were sort of more, you know, hardware oriented and more guys oriented. Mm. Um, I don't want to say like model trains or something that's stupid, but you know what I mean. Oh, I know, uh, absolutely. And it was, um, yeah, 150,000, which by today, if a, if a big budget AAA game like Gabriel Knight 1 and 2 sold that much, it would be a disaster. The company would... You know, everyone would commit ritual suicide if that's all they sold. But for for at the time, that was three hundred thousand total was was a success. Um, and I and think it, that's what happened with the publishers is they just saw this whole different market that was a much bigger market, and and they went that way a hundred percent. You know, I mean that mm. you know the last fifteen years, you know, the main the big publishers, you know, Sony, Activision, um, you know, they they haven't been interested in variety. They've been interested in you know, making games for a very specific market, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is the sort of 18 to 25 year old uh, male market. And, you know, and they've had huge success with that. Um, sure. And they, so, they've spent... You know, they really, why, why would you want, you know, if I was, honestly, if I were the president of Activision and I, you know, was used to $20 million projects like, the, you know, like Halo or uh, who, you know, which would bring in $500 million, why, why would I be interested in making this, you know, one million dollar little adventure game that could maybe return three or four times my, you know, my investment. I mean, it's just, it's still sure. not even worth their time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of uh, just the cold business of it, um, as the amount of money people could make off games expanded, the amount of games that they made narrowed, it sounds like. So it was just action games. So there you are with Gabriel Knight 3. Um, years you've worked on it. And, it. and if I remember correctly, it, when it came out, it was not a critical. It was a critical success, but not necessarily a financial success. Am I remembering that right? I think it did about the same as GK two and GK one, maybe a little bit less. Um, yeah. And critically, it it did fine. Uh, it just you know, it, honestly, I mean, even before that game shipped, I was out of Sierra. Uh, oh, wow. In fact. Um, I remember waiting for it to ship because. You know, at some point, your work as a designer is done. You know, the content is complete, and it's just bug smashing at that point. Hmm. And so I had pretty much moved out of my office and because I knew there wasn't going to be another game. Um, and I was working on at home on a novel. And, you know, I remember just waiting months for them to finally just call me and say it finally went gold. You know, it finally shipped. Um, so, wow. yeah, I was I was already out by that time that it actually hit the market. Sure, physically and mentally, it sounds like you were more or less moved on from that. And and had you made a decision that you didn't want to work on games anymore at that point? Yeah, I felt that way at the time. In fact, I remember that um, I think we took Gabriel 3 to E3, and that was the first E3 that I had been to where it was all just, like, girls walking around in bikinis, you know, guys in camo, and, you know, like, and I was just like, what the fuck am I doing here, you know? It's like, this is not my market and uh huh then and I just, it was kind of like okay this is not you know this yeah. is not really where i need to be sure sure so, sure um, you were, at the you time were... i was really uh thought that was it i'm not going to do any more games um i'm going to write novels and and i did for a few years yeah yeah uh, do you think it was that with gabriel too you were picturing and rightly so that you may end up entering kind of the the next echelon of of media that's respected by the culture in general. Video games are moving towards being, 
you know, maybe something that you would see at the Oscars, and then a few years later, you feel like you're at yeah. the, the toy store, the, the the very best, it sounds like, or the, the car show. Was that part of why you ended up feeling like you had kind of had the wind knocked out of you in terms of game development, to have that arc down in that way? I guess so. I mean, you know, it, you put it that way, it did really suck. <laughs> you know, but, um, <laughs> well, just in talking to you for the past, oh, 40 minutes. You know, it's sort of a long, it was a long period of years, you know, of what you're talking about. And, you know, in hindsight, yeah, I can see that was, you know, and it was disappointing. But, you know, I just felt, you know, again, that, that last E3, it was just like, you know, this is not my market. And even if I could change enough to be a designer in this market, I, I don't want to be, you know, it's not mm. my kind of game. It's not, I wouldn't want to make these kind of games. And so, um, sure. Yeah. And, and to, to be pitted against a market like that and think I'm not supposed to follow this when I was leading the market all of five years ago, I was innovating with a whole new kind of uh, setting for a game, a whole new kind of feel for a game. Now I have to just... You're really depressing me. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the part of the story of the show where we hit our low point, you know, in the romantic <laughs> comedies where they break up. You and video games broke That's up right. at that point. But you've up. gotten back together with them since. And it's have, been yeah. extremely exciting to see that. But before we get to that, you wrote novels for a little bit. How did that feel to transition from from game designing to be able to create this whole world, uh, both visually in terms of uh, and writing and, and even acting, to kind of focusing just on on the text, just on communicating with words. What was that transition like? I, I really love uh, just writing a book. Um, it's it's very 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 peaceful you know there's no stress to it I mean you sit in a chair in your pajamas or whatever and you write and uh, you know there's no there's no team so you know there's good and bad about that I mean I, I love I've loved working on Mobius um, you know it's exciting to see your story come to life in art and voices and you know I mean there's wonderful things about that too but you know it's also you know just a much more demanding um, role than it's just me and my computer. So sure. uh, I, I did really enjoy that. The, the few years I would just stay at home and, and wrote. But um, yeah, I mean, I was happy when I did get back into games. And what, uh, what inspired you to get back into games? It was, was how many, six years, eight years? How long was your hiatus? Well, I actually started back in about 2002. So it was only a few years, really. Um, yeah. I think GK3 shipped in 99 I want to say. Oh, okay. So it was only 4 Maybe years. 96. So. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Close enough. 93, 95, 99. I think it was 99. Um Okay. Well, I got a call from somebody actually who was uh they had a company in New York and they did online storefront software and they wanted to get into games. And they had researched the marketplace and they had decided that uh, they wanted to get into casual games. And this was pretty, it was pretty new at the time. Um, like I think Big Fish had just started. Mm -hmm. And having looked at the casual gaming market, they had reached the conclusion that it was largely, lar largely female. So they wanted somebody to head up that effort who was going to be sympathetic to that market. And it happened that somebody that worked there was a huge fan of Gabriel Knight. And so Long story short, they ended up hiring me. To I'm sorry, wild dogs. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Every once in a while, it happens. So they turned to you to head up uh, a new casual division. Mm -hmm. Huh. And we eventually broke off of that company and ended up founding Obron Media. I think in 2003, it was myself and two um, business partners who started that casual game company. And how did you approach that after having? Uh, created uh, Gabriel Knight 2 in particular, where you're staging operas and telling this uh, grand epic story to kind of narrowing the focus. Did you feel like that was getting back to roots of just thinking about game design, or was that about uh, leading an audience or chasing an audience? What What was your thinking in terms of how to approach this kind of whole new market? Well, the thing is that I'm I'm a really big fan of puzzles. My dad was a mathematician, and he used to make up mathematical puzzles actually and you know things like Rubik's Cubes and stuff we always had around the house so mm. I've always loved little puzzle games and I didn't have any problem you know just designing some of them I think 
first game that we released as Oberon Media was called um, Betrapped, and it was basically a little logic game, or Inspector Parker was before that, uh, a little logic game with a sort of clue-like murder mystery theme to it. Um, so the, they were fun, and also, you know, the, the nice thing about those little games is that they're fast, right? I mean, they're not two years in production. It's like you get an idea, you know, and four or five months later, it's on the market. Um, so they were low budget, they were fast, and, you know, just fun to do. Um, and then we started doing hidden object games. I think we were we were one of the first companies to do those. We, the first one I did was, uh, was the Agatha Christie Death on the Nile. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that was actually a really fun story because I'm a, I'm a big fan of Agatha Christie and uh, we did two games for them, Death on the Nile and Parallel In-House, I think. And then I got to go to London and meet with the um, the license manager, which was a, is a, a house there in London, was an agency in London. And we got to go out to lunch with uh, Agatha Christie's like great nephew who currently runs the, the properties and in this private London club, and it was just it was it was, it was awesome. Wow. Kind of one of my uh, formative experiences as a game designer. But anyway, so we did um, we started doing hidden object games, and I did about six or seven of those. And you know what was fun about that was you know every time I tried to put more and more story in it and more and more adventure game elements. Like I think we were probably one of the first that um, had inventory in a hidden object game. Um, topic choices for dialogue and, and things like that. So I was able to sort of baby step towards um, being a true light adventure game. But, you know, the thing there is that, you know, we had very, you know, it was, it was very much about business decisions. You know, we had, you know, we had to have two games out this year and like, here's the, you know, the set budget for every single one of them. And, you know, you can't only have 30 rooms. And so I was never able to really kind of push it as much as I wanted to. Huh, but he still had it in you to want to expand the scope of the game beyond um, simply finding the hidden objects. And tell me about the, the psychology that goes into designing a hidden object game, because uh, on paper you wouldn't think that they would be as compelling as they are, but it's a pretty huge, huge genre that not a lot of people are necessarily talking about. But how do you make one of those fun? How do you make sure it's fun? Well, the thing about hidden object is that... Um... First of all, it is a huge, it is a really big market. I mean, Big Fish pumps out like one a day or something. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's an 80% female market. Uh -huh. uh, it's 35 plus. So that's exciting to me as a designer because I know that that market would love Gabriel Knight. You know, I know mm -hmm. that market, those people would love Mobius, you know. Sure. And they would love for me to make, which I would love to do, um, you know, like a Regency romance adventure game. So... I love those people, you know, and I was always trying to sort of, like I said, push us more towards adventure, but, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of making a hidden object fun, it's, it's, it's just an interesting game mechanic. I think it's just, it's so easy. It's like you're just visually finding things, you know, mm -hmm. but it's very addictive, and if you think about any gameplay that's popular, like Pong, I mean, it is ultimately, it does break down to something very, very, very simple, mm -hmm. but, but repetitive that just addicts your brain to it and um yeah you know, there are basic rules for making a good scene you want things always have to be fair you know they can't be you know so small or so hidden that you can't find them and you know it's just sort of a, a whole philosophy to making a good hidden object scene but i was more interested in the overall story of the game you know uh the characters um Giving you trying to make it a richer experience, not just the hidden object, but, you know, one of the things you hit, pick up in the hidden object scene is a letter, you know, that tells you some information about the story, you know, getting more of a story um, into it. Right, 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 incorporating more to the context so you feel like there's purpose behind it, and then focus just on finding the object again so your brain is entertained with the, the simple problem solving, then opening the mind up again to the larger story, that kind of macro, micro perspective Playing with that sounds like it's a big part of why they've been successful. And it's also part of adventure gaming. I, I think of those as kind of hidden object in a way. You're looking around the, the scene for something to fit with something else. Not to diss Monkey Island 2, because I love it, but there are a couple puzzles in there where I just blindly clicked on anything until eventually... I think it was when I had to put a banana on a metronome to hypnotize a monkey into playing the piano. There was no logic behind that. 
Tim <laughs> Schaefer and Ron Gilbert, you rascals. Uh, so, and now you're you're fully back where you where you started with Gabriel Knight, 20th anniversary and, and Mobius. How did that come to be to to bring those genres back, or bring those series back, or start a new series and bring back an old one? Well, um, a few years ago. Bob and I were talking about starting our own little studio because we moved to this uh, farm in Pennsylvania and it's, you know, sort of remote and we really wanted to do this work from home and do a little studio together. And um, we started working on, I recently got my first iPad and just love it, love it, love it. And uh, so we started working on like a little kid's game. So, you know, our, our, our idea initially was, well, we'll make this little kid's game and then maybe it'll make enough money where we could quit our job, regular jobs and we'll make another little kid's game and eventually we'll be able to make, you know, adventure games. But then kicks, you know, Tim, Tim Schafer's Kickstarter happened and we were like, maybe we don't need to like baby step this quite so slowly. Sure. Um, so we just decided to take a chance and do a Kickstarter for a full adventure game. And you pulled it off. And that was Mobius, right? Mobius I came first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah. So you know Tim Schafer, I guess. How did it feel to to watch? Because he's had a similar arc as you, from what I can tell. The adventure, the death of the adventure game genre, really hurt his career. He tried to hang on with games that were kind of meeting both audiences: half action, half uh, puzzle solving games like Psychonauts and. Uh, brutal legend, but he they just weren't selling uh, to the degree that publishers wanted, and then he came back with uh, Kickstarter. How was it for you to watch his arc, and um, how do you feel about the success he's had? Well, I wasn't following him all that closely um, until I saw the Kickstarter, and you know, it, was just, it was just amazing that, like, I think it just made a lot of people feel like, wow, you know, people really want adventure games, and mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to say, you know, fuck you, publishers, but you know, it's a little bit to it of like, you know, this sort of revelation of like, we don't have to sell this idea and get somebody, you know, at a huge publisher to sign off on it. You know, we could just go right to the people and do it. You know, and um, it was just amazing to see that game. That Kickstarter too is so amazing yeah, as well. I think a lot of us were amazed. And uh, before I move on uh, past it too far, because I'm kind of too far, but I'll I'll see if I can force a stop. Was there a big rivalry at Sierra and Lucas Games and Lucas Arts? Did you feel uh, competitive, uh, collaborative? Were you looking to them for inspiration, or were you looking to try to beat them at that genre? Because it was really head to head. And I remember. Um, as childish as it was, people would pick teams when I was uh, playing those games. Growing, you were a Lucas Arts guy or a Sierra guy, and you know, oh, King's Quest is way better. Blah blah blah. So, where did that uh, was that also involved in the the developers, or was that just us fans taking on that kind of competitive uh, thinking? I don't remember uh, it really thinking about the competitive nature of it so much when I was at Sierra. I mean, you know, I was we were all aware of what LucasArts was putting out and like I remember when Indiana Jones came out and you know and it was motivating and just like when you you know you read a great book or you see a great film and you're like I want to you know why didn't I do that I want to do that you know um, sure. so I think we you know I think they probably inspired us to try to do better and make great games and um, I don't know I about that. vice versa but oh, I, bet. You know, I think yeah. I think actually you know LucasArts to me was sort of more of a boy company and Sierra was really sort of their projects I think were more female oriented like King's Quest, if you think about King's Quest it's very I don't want to say twee but you know it's it's very sweet kind of um, yeah. has that you know fairy tale vibe and like versus you know the Sam and Max which is like really hardcore funky sure. um, and I think Telltale is really inherited that mantle in you know sort of one of my visions for Pinkerton Row when we first started was you know to be more of a modern adventure game company like Telltale but to take sort of more of that feminine you know some little and I don't want to say you know like we're making girl games was we're not but you know just that little bit more of a you know not quite so hardcore mm. you know more gender neutral How in general. Like a puppy dog you know sort of <laughs> well approach. you've got handsome men 
in fine yeah. clothes traveling the world. That's going to appeal to women, but and men too. And you've got a uh, uh, mystery, sci-fi, fantasy. Um, I, I think you're on the right track for for pulling off kind of the a new Sierra. Yeah, to, to tell tales, uh, LucasArts. It's a wonderful way of looking at it. Maybe I said it, you didn't. So you can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. I just don't really have the ambition on the business end. I mean, honestly, this last few years, the most difficult thing has been that, um, you know, the business side because I, I've always been able to just design and just write and have somebody else take care of all that crap. Sure. And now that we have our own studio with the Kickstarter, you know, basically I've had to wear all the hats and you know be CEO and CFO and tax accountant and you know producer and it's just. You know, I hate that shit, honestly. So, um, I think I've decided I don't necessarily have the ambition to be a big, uh, a big studio. Um, actually, we, we've been working more with Phoenix Online, who has taken on some more of our business role. And, you know, my ambition at this point is just to really focus on the creative and um, hopefully make some more great adventure games from the design end. Sure. But well, it sounded like. Um, please stop me if I'm wrong on it, but that was. A lot of what Sierra was about too. It was about okay, we trust you creatively. You're going to go for this, and you know, we're not going to focus test and you know, or, or make this by committee. We're right. going to put the the artist out first, and you had huge success. And I would hope uh, you would continue to to have that kind of success now. And if you do, you might not want to do it, but you may end up with a company as big as Telltale. You never know. It took them a while to get to where they are today, but. Um, now they're making so much money and putting out like the Game of Thrones game and wow. Walking Dead game and uh, the Borderlands game based on a shooter. They co-opted a game that was based on Doom and are turning it into like an adventure game. Wow! So it's nice to see that they've turn around. Great, you know, they've done a huge service for adventure game fans and adventure game designers in this industry, and you know, I I think we all owe them a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have questions coming in from the, the viewers, which is great. I have a question I really want to ask you, though. I always get selfish and stick with my own questions, but I'm going to be strong <laughs> and do the, the uh, viewer. Thank you so much, viewers, for asking these questions. Our Xanadu asks, I have a good feeling Holmes is going to ask about what Jane thinks of Broken Age and more recent uh, point-and-click adventure games, but just in case he doesn't, could you put a word out for me? I was, I totally forgot to ask you about Broken Age. Have you seen Broken Age, Jane? I haven't, I haven't. Um, but I'm a big fan of Walking Dead. I love that game. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That seems and, more your style. Yeah, I'm sorry, go on. Um, I really like a lot of the Telltale games. Uh, uh, the puzzle game, Hector. Uh, no. I don't know puzzle if I played Agent. that one. Puzzle oh, Agent. yeah, Puzzle Agent was awesome. Yeah. Uh, so sad it didn't, I think it was started as a series. I think they only got to the second game, if I remember yeah. correctly. That this was a lot of fun. Was... Sure, um, absolutely. And Hector, and, you know, so I've played a number of their games, but I haven't played Bro Broken Age. I don't have to get to it. Yeah, that's Tim. That's that Kickstarter that made all... Um, anyway, we can go on more about that, but we won't. Bob the Cat Lowell yeah, I did, I did yeah. uh, support that, but I haven't just haven't had time to play it. <laughs> sure. Trying to get Mobius out the door. By the way, we're shipping Mobius April fifteenth. April fifteenth. Um, Woof! That is exciting. And is that episodic or is that the full game? No, it's, it's just, the full game. Whoa! That is. Uh, you beat Tim Schafer on that one. You got that out already. And your Kickstarter was after his, and you're getting your game yeah. out before his full game is done. Score one for Jane. And it's uh, you know, it's a pretty big game. I mean, we've. You know, I think it's probably at least 20 hours, and, you know, our beta testers have said, well, this is a really a long game. So, I mean, again, and we, you know, we had a very challenging budget to work with, but um, I'm very proud of that. I mean, it's, there's tons of cinematics in it, which I love, you know, just a lot of dramatic cutscenes and scary stuff and, you know, relationship stuff. And so huh. hopefully, I mean, our, you know, we have a, uh, about 6,000 people in our CSG from our Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the general consensus seems to be that this really feels like a Jane Jensen game, you know, old, like, like there hasn't been a game like this since Gabriel Knight. So right. um, hopefully the market's still interested in that. We'll see. Yeah, I'm pretty confident it will be. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the premise of Mobius for those who don't know how it plays? what kind of things, uh, what kind of feelings people can expect to get out of it, what you were going for with it. It's um, It's got a little bit of sort of Sherlock Holmes in it. Uh, 
the BBC version and um, James Bond and uh, Gabriel Knight. It's the story. Uh, the main character is an expert at antiquities. He travels around the world evaluating antiques, and he could just look at something and go, "Well, okay, well that varnish is, you know, was done in Venice in, you know, 1820, and the hinges are, you know." He's like this incredible expert in this stuff, and he's hired at the beginning of the game by this secretive government agency to investigate the death of a woman and see if she reminds him of anybody in history of a particular person because he knows all these facts about, you know, he's got this photographic memory of all these facts about people. So um, a lot of what you do in the, in the game, there's the, there are these puzzles where, you know, you actually will investigate somebody's life and you find out, for example, that she was married at 19 to a 45-year-old and then she had her first baby at uh, 20 and he or he was had a heart defect or something and you can basically he will you know, the main character kind of can go through his mind and it's sort of like this high-tech thing well he'll go that was just like Marie Antoinette or whatever um, so he starts realizing that there's something going on with this agency and it, it's kind of fun because every chapter that you go there's seven chapters it kind of peels back another layer of what is really going on and there's this whole sort of paranormal element to it um, and then there's a there's a pretty heavy subplot of a relationship between this main character who's this, he's just so smart that he's really uh, sort of antisocial and um, acerbic and, uh, you know, kind of a, a smart-ass character like House or like Sherlock. But he, he meets this other character and, you know, there's this whole sort of fate, reoccurring history thing that happens in this game that, that sort of uh, builds up this relationship. But anyway... Um, it's, it's it's a thriller. Uh, it's uh, you know you do travel all over the world. Um, there's definitely mystery elements to it, uh, some paranormal elements, and I think just a lot of beautiful visuals. Ah, sounds fantastic. Sounds like uh, when did you start working on it? When did you first have the concept for it? I actually got the idea for it. I was <laughs> I was. Uh, Pitching, I was asked to pitch like five different story ideas to a big game company, and I was on a flight trying to think of ideas, and I came up with this idea, and it was like so good, I'm like, I'm not going to pitch this, I want to save this one. Uh, so I did, I saved it for myself, but it was just sort of the, 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 the core idea I got was, what if history is just about repeating patterns? Like, if you think about uh, the movie 300, where this small group of of soldiers face this invading force, right, and repel them. Mm. What if that same thing just reoccurs through history with just different on different locations with different people, right? But the, the exact same pattern of events happens. If you could learn to read those events, then you could predict the future, right? Sure. So that's sort of the, the basis of Mobius, the big idea behind Mobius, is that these agencies are really trying to map these patterns and... Uh, it's huh. kind of cool, I think. Yeah, it sounds very cool. Is it? I, I want to know more, but I uh, I don't want you to give it away either. I have all these questions no, about no, if it's. Let's play it now. <laughs> yeah, I can't help. I want to know, but the Mobius strip for people who don't know, they didn't go to math class. So I think that's where they taught that. Uh, it is. It looks like oh, it, uh, a separate thing, but it's actually one continuous infinite strip. So what is going forward actually leads you back. Uh, smart. Uh -huh. <laughs> Actually, I think we're going to be going up for pre-orders soon, um, yeah. by the end of March. And if you pre-order, you'll get the a demo that you can download the first couple chapters for free. So, oh, cool! So the the demo it. right at point of pre-order, you can um, get a demo. Mm -hmm. Ah, awesome! Uh, I really look forward to that. Uh, a couple of other questions. Bob the Cat Lol, who is a frequent viewer of the show. Thank you, Bob for being here. What is your approach to writing dialogue? Whoa! That is a general question. Field it as, as however you'd like when you're taking on characters, talking to each other. Do you get into the each character's head and try to take on their perspective? Do you think of people that you've met in the past and try to copy them? Or a little bit of both? Well, before I write dialogue, I really need to understand the character, so usually I'll write a little perspectives on it, on each character, and like I'll know a lot about their backstory that probably never ever is going to be in the, the actual game, but it's just something that I need to know. Um, I don't know, you know, I just, uh, it's something I think that I've 
gotten a lot better at over the years. And when I write novels now, um, which I still do, uh, you know, that's probably the easiest thing for me. I'm much more comfortable writing dialogue than I am writing narrative, you know, like, and then she walked to the door, you know, it's like, well, that's so boring, you know, I just want to write dialogue. <laughs> so I think I'm probably inherently more of a, a screenplay writer at heart, but, um, you know, the, the other thing that I do is I will, I will read it out. I have to read it out loud, so I'll kind of read it out loud and act it out, and I usually do a pretty strong editing pass on that. Um, you know, it's, the challenging thing is trying to make it interesting because it's it's not difficult to write dialogue that's just like how are you oh I'm fine how are you you know but you know what the hard thing is to actually find something interesting to say, uh, and and sort of have dialogue that's a little shocking you know it's mm -hmm. a little uh, unexpected and you know part of that is just having a great character I mean you you know you you need to have a character who is and this is you know Gabriel was a smart ass he was a womanizer so he would say outrageous things uh, and Malachi is you know he's he's, he's an ass really I mean in, in Malachi Mobius, is you Mobius have, right. mm -hmm. you have often when you talk to people in, in Mobius you'll have the choice to either say something really rude back to them or be nice and you know if you really are a smart player you probably want to take the nice path but it's more fun to actually have him just say really incredibly rude things so um, you know, a lot of that is just you know having a character who would say something outrageous because it's more fun to to write dialogue and to listen to dialogue when somebody's saying something crazy than it is when they're just being normal. Sure, sure, sure. So you got to is that part of the the fantasy to get to live out the the snarky, witty dialogue that we don't get to think of in real life or maybe don't have the guts to to actually say, but in these games you can yeah. kind of safely be that person. Um, do you follow, do you like a lot of uh, fiction about anti-heroes? Do you follow, like, Breaking Bad and Mad Men and those sorts of shows? Uh, I really like sort of more historical stuff like Game of Thrones and Vikings. Um, and, you know, my absolute favorite is BBC Sherlock. I'm totally a fangirl for that. And I've actually written fan fiction for it, if you believe it or not. Um, Can I get it? But, Where is it? Where's the fan fiction? Challenge. <laughs> I'm not telling you. No. Oh, I so badly want to read that. Oh, um, what do you think it is that, that draws you to these kinds of characters who have this intelligence, but kind of? <sighs> to me, Gabriel Knight never came across as someone who was sadistic, but he didn't care if anyone liked him. I, I guess that for me was the appeal to be free of that concern about is anyone gonna. Uh, care about me or like me, he, he just didn't care what anybody thought. He didn't go out of his way to be hurtful, but he didn't go out of his way to please others. Is that um, uh, an appealing character type to you for any particular reason? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, I usually tend to write mystery stories when I'm doing a game design, like even, you know, it's kind of interesting because I've never really done, like, straight up British murder mysteries or anything. I guess I did with Egg of the Christie, but that wasn't really my story. But um, you know, the, the, because mysteries are inherently uh, puzzle oriented, and so it's much easier to write a game design with a mystery plot than with, say, a romance or uh, a family drama or something like that. You know, God knows, contemporary romance. I don't, you know, be tough to make that into a, a game design. But um, it's a similar thing. I mean, with you know, to write to make dialogue easy to write and fun to write. Again, you know, you need a character that's just, uh, you know, interesting to write for. And so I, you know, I try to, I guess that's the why I'm drawn to these sorts of anti-hero characters. Huh, makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, more questions. I almost did my own question again. Uh, Monkey Nohito asks, did you play a big role in the hidden object game genre shifting from discovery, 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 Division, diversionary, that's a new word to me, sorry about that, <laughs> diversionary puzzles to more of a story-driven adventure experience today. Yeah, do you feel like you, because they have changed a lot, and you were there making high-profile games like the Agatha Christie games, do you feel like you've influenced the, the video game industry and the, the market yet again by helping to change the path of where hidden object games have gone? I hope so. Um, I think, you know, the Agatha Christie Death on the Nile was the first one that really did have an intense story. And it was, you know, it's because, it, you know, I was working with a, a fantastic story there and I wanted it to bring it into the game and not have it just be, you know, some sort of 
visual theme or something, but to really, really tell that mystery. And then, um, you know, we I did a series of James Patterson's uh, Women's Murder Club games. I think I did three of those. And then, actually, we did a game with Charlene Harris, who wrote True Blood. Mm. Uh, we did an, an original game story with her uh, called Dying for Daylight, which had a female vampire character. So I, I hope so. I mean, certainly, um, since we began doing those games, other companies did more and more story. Whether or not it had anything to do with what I was doing, I don't know. But um, I certainly always tried every single game to do more of that. Uh, than we had the last time. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. And you're speaking to an audience, like you said before, that you can be sympathetic to. You feel like you're speaking to, to women such as yourself a lot of the time. But I'm still hung up on this split where I don't see the kinds of games you've been working on having a big profile at E3. I'm still seeing a lot of women in bikinis and guys in camo, but now they're actually walking around in like full body transformer suits and stuff <laughs> like that. They're just throwing more and more money into it. And we, we actually met that time at E3. Yeah. Uh, that was very nice to meet you. Uh, were you uh, roaming around the, the show floor uh, at that show or were you just meeting with, with developers or were you taking in the whole culture at the time as well? I had a pretty packed schedule with press, so um, I did get to go on the floor once. You know, the thing is, I don't think that we're going to change the mainstream market, and I don't want to. I mean, I don't need to. You know, I just, you know, my only goal is I'd like to see the computer gaming industry have more diversity. You know, it would be like if every movie that ever came out was Terminator or Terminator-like. You know, sure. I mean, you know, what about... Pride and Prejudice, what about, you know, My Dinner with Andre, what about, you know, like Chocolate for Water, you know what I mean? Sure, sure, sure. I just want to see more diversity, and I think there should be games that um, appeal to women gamers and, you know, kid, little kids and, you know, families, and, you know, let's just, let's just have a variety. I mean, you know, the last 10 years, you know, when you would go to GameStop, basically everything on the shelf looked like everything else on the shelf, and... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just think there should be more variety, and, and, and the reason why there hasn't been probably be, is because, um, you know, the games had huge budgets, and there just wasn't, you know, the publishers were interest, or were not interested in making, you know, little games for a little market, and that's where I think the indie, mar the indie uh, industry sure. can really make a difference, and, you know, um, you know, produce some of these games that we've been lacking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We've seen some big publishers, uh, after uh, Walking Dead did so well, I think we'll see more of it, but Sony is putting out games like Journey. Uh, we've actually had one of the developers on Journey on her name's uh, Keely Santiago. I think you two would get along really well. Um, I don't know if you've ever met her, but uh, you two have a lot in common. Um, but still, like you said, it, it, the, the, I think you called it the mainstream market is not really the mainstream. I mean, the mainstream is all of the United States and all of the world, but instead we're focusing on this little uh, demographic within this wide market and trying to sell games only to them, uh, though you've been very successful uh, on PC anyway, selling games to a wider market. Do you think PC is the place to sell games for everybody at this point because everyone has a computer? Do you think that's why 80% of that market that you were working towards with uh, the casual games were, were women? Um, I'm really interested in the tablet market myself. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because my husband was on a flight um, not long ago, and sitting next to him were like two 60-year-old women, and they were both on their Kindles playing word games. And, um, you know, if you ask somebody like that, do you play computer games? And they'd be like, no, I don't play computer games. My grandson plays computer games, you know? Sure. Like, no, you do. I mean, have you ever have you ever played a hidden object? Oh, yeah, I play a hidden object all the time. Well, that's a computer game, you know? I mean, but I think, I just, I, you know, I would like to see us broadening out more. And, um, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a pipe dream to sort of try to hit that market with adventure games. And, you know, a game like Mobius is very cross-gender. I mean, it's not uh, a pink game. It's not a girl game. It's, you know, a game that hopefully will appeal to guys as well. But, um... It's a game for human beings, I think. It's One just it's more like a, you know, like a TV show. It's it's um, you know like Fringe or something. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I, I, I like the tablet market because 
uh, a lot of tablet owners are female and also people buy tablets to read you know a mm. lot a lot of people do and, and that's a great market for us I mean basically that's what we are we're 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 stories at the, in the at the end of the day so mm-hmm. um, hopefully we can make an impression there I, I sure think you will but uh, the, on the other side of my head I keep thinking about how for whatever reason since doom like you mentioned there's been this idea of selling video games to, to men with the promise of this making you like you're like a tough guy for liking this game about shooting stuff and they make a point to shame the casual market which is kind of code for the feminine market the the, the not uh, hyper masculine uh, shotgun to the face packed with steroids killing aliens and dragons and whatnot market and when you say like if in mixed company I would go to, to like PAX and, and stuff like that, and people knew I liked games like, I don't know, Adventure Games or Animal Crossing or whatever, and they would like uh, call me out and start like screaming, oh, casual, uh, and then casual. Oh uh, yeah, there's a real, I, I hope you've been more or less sheltered from it, but there's like a real shame that men have been made to feel for liking casual games and not being hardcore, which hardcore is such a euphemism for all sorts of parts of the man's body that they're probably trying to compensate for. I'm a real not fan of the term hardcore. I think it's real divisive and uh, sets up a class distinction that's just kind of useless. Can't we just have games for everybody? Uh, Instead, I feel like it's been a strategy to make men feel good about themselves for playing certain kinds of games to not feel like they're geeks anymore, to feel like they're tough guys for playing tough guy games. And um, that might make them afraid of how it's going to make their image look to play a game that they're not sure is kind of hardcore enough. Oh, I wish I hadn't told you all this. Because now what if you're going to be tempted to make a game about, uh, you know, Mobius 2, the the total reload where he's just blowing up (laughs) history and whatnot. I hope that doesn't happen. Oh, uh, geez, I should have kept my big mouth shut. No, anyway. I mean, there, you know, there's definitely, there, you know, I've noticed on the net, there are definitely haters who mm. who just like to, um, you know, get on and basically, you know, sure. denigrate and mock uh, adventure games or anything like that. And, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to make games for that audience, you know. I'm making games for a different audience and, you know, and... I don't know. I mean, like I said, uh, there should just be room enough for everybody to have, you know, for there to be different genres of game, not just one genre. Sure. And also, like Uh, you said, like a TV show like Fringe, why can't we, or The Walking Dead appeals to a lot of women I know. Half the the people I know who watch that show are just in love with Daryl Dixon and also relate with the survival peril that they're in. Uh, Why can't we have video games that are... You don't have to tout whatever gender you are in order to feel good about watching it. You know, that's a really good point. I mean, that may be one reason why The Walking Dead has been so popular is because even though it's an adventure, it's okay because it has zombies and, you know, mm. dis, you know disembodied limbs and things like that. So, <laughs> Sure. Uh, yeah. Maybe I just need to that. write a zombie game. I don't know. I would love for you to write uh, a Walking Dead game or any sort of zombie game. That would be amazing. Um, and that brings me to a point, I guess, wow, we're running out of time already. Um, we did talk a little bit before the show. I was going to ask if you knew anything about the years ago now. I think E3, maybe 2011, 12, there was talk of Telltale trying to bring back King's Quest. Uh, were you consulted on that? Um. I did talk a little bit to Telltale about the possibility of being involved with that project, but it was it was it never really got past or you know wouldn't this be interesting? But um, mm. yeah, I think they were going to remake that game, and then um, they just didn't it didn't get done in time, and so I think I don't I don't think they have the rights anymore, but I'm not sure about that. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, if you were to go back to any of those. Sierra. Well, you've got Gabriel Knight, which is fantastic, but would you want to go back to Police Quest or and uh, or to King's Quest? Probably not Police Quest. Um, you know, I would love to do a Colonel's Bequest game. I always loved Colonel's Bequest. Oh uh, yeah. And King's Quest, I, I I would be involved with that. Yeah. Huh. Do you have any ideas? Have you thought about what you would want to do with that? Would you consult with Roberta um, as well? Do you think she would want to be involved? 
if she was available, I think she's pretty happily retired, but, um, and like cruising the world or something, but, um, I mean, yeah, sure. Huh. If, if that was an option, sure. I'm trying to, so Roberta retired. I'm trying to picture, because video game developers, I imagine, must feel like that it's time to rest uh, eventually, but so many of them end up working <laughs> into, you know, as, as long as they want, because it's not a, a field where you necessarily They don't have to retire, be... they just get blown away. I don't know. <laughs> some of them, some of them do, sadly. Uh, I think the developer of Pong, he's like 90, Noah Bushnell, I think his name is. He was trying to put out a new game not that long ago, though I'm not sure how involved he was, actually. So do you think about retiring, just cruising the world someday after Pinkerton Road is pulling in multi-millions in sales and whatnot? Well, you know, my idea of retirement is, like I said, I, I mean, you know, I would... I could picture just writing the design for a game and, and maybe meeting with the team once a month or something to over, look, just look at the progress and, uh, you know, doing a few uh, PR calls a year or something. But, um, you know, just not being involved with the heavy, stressful business end of it. So I, I will probably always write. I, I still also write fiction on my own under pseud a pseudonym. Um, so I, I can't imagine a time when I would not be writing something. Yeah, seems like whether you want to or not, you're just creating. Doesn't sound like you've really had a break at all, actually, since you were a, 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 a programmer at Hewlett Packard, but even then you were working on novels. Yeah, did you ever get to make that novel that you wanted to make all those years ago? No, that's still sitting in a drawer somewhere. Like, yeah, yeah? but, but I, it could I've happen. People say that you know, you 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 basically just throw away your first couple novels, and I think that's true. I don't know that it was worth <laughs> worth publishing. Sure. Huh. Well, you never know. It's so hard for you to know for certain, I guess. Um, have you ever put out a game that you thought, or put out anything that you thought, I'm not sure if I even like this at this point where you're so close to it, and then it turns out that people end up adoring it? I think you're always um, unsure at the time that it goes out, because uh, you have been so close to it. And, and the thing is, too, that you just don't, you really don't, you really don't know. I mean, mm. um, you know, you could have one story that just resonates with people and goes crazy, and another one that you thought was just as good that nobody likes. So it's, it's just, um, you know, I don't know. It's, I don't want to say it's luck of the draw, but you know, it's just you, you never know. You never know how how people will respond to stuff. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, in the world of Mobius, of course, it's all because it's repeating history. So if you were able to analyze what was successful last time, you could just do it again. Um, only the world would be that simple. But the whole simple. world would have to be the same. I mean, it would have to be like the conditions of 1993 and the same industry and, you know. Sure, sure, sure. Sadly, it's not the case. But but bringing it back to 1993, the, the Gabriel Knight remake, um, we, I feel like we hadn't focused on that as much as I wanted to. Uh, how has that been to work on, and, and are you taking the opportunity to do things differently this time that you wish you could have done in the past? Um, there's a whole George Lucas effect that sometimes people get afraid of. You know, are you going to add pink lightsabers and a new musical number that nobody wanted, or are you going to, um, you know, more or less stay true to the original? How has uh, approaching that been, and how has that felt? Well, you know, you, you just can't really worry about it too much because you just get, we would get immobilized. You know, I, I just, I'm just trying to make, I mean, the big goals that I had when I first started is I wanted to, um, I wanted to inject more New Orleans flavor to it um, with the better graphics and if possible, a little bit, you know, even more scary. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's frightening that we have this, High resolution Retina display now. I mean, you know, like I'm play testing it, and it's like you're in the Voodoo shop, and you know, it's it's kind of like the first uh, time you saw in the news in HD. It's like I can see his pores. Oh my god, you know, I don't want to see that. And you know, but it's like you, you know, we have to give him facial expressions because like there's, it's just so high resolution, you know, and it's um, it, it's it's amazing. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. It's it's scary because we really don't have a lot of time to do it. You know, we've got to be shipping it by July, August. So. Uh, oh my God! Really? When did you start yeah. work on it? Well, uh, in the current incarnation, uh, we started in September. Um, 
Wow, that's a lot of work to do. And did you have to reclaim the rights from, from Sierra? Was there a whole story behind that? We, we signed a deal with Activision uh, oh. to do the game. They own the Gabriel Light series at this point. So we just have the rights to remake the first game. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's it's really exciting. It's 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 a beautiful game. Um, you know, the art is amazing. And, uh, you know, hopefully, I mean, it, it's 100% it's the original game. We, we're not mm -hmm. taking out one puzzle. Sure. You know, we're not taking out uh, one location. There are some new things that we're adding in just just to, you know. Huh. Can you give me? Cool. Can. Sure. I'd love to get a hint about something. Is it new storyline aspect, new environment, new puzzle, new problem? We have a few new environments. Like um, there's now an outside of the, of the police station, whereas mm. before you would just go right into the lobby. Um, and we actually added a puzzle there that was in the GK1 novelization. That was this really cool scene where when Gabriel goes to get the tracker on day five or something, something happens in the police station that was really creepy and scary, and it wasn't in the game, and we decided that we wanted to put that in there. So we ended up adding this whole back entrance into his office. and um, So a few things like that, and there's some uh, full-screen puzzles that we added in that are... Um, a little more complicated. Like there was, there's a full screen puzzle we added into Moonbeam's house, sort of ask the Loa puzzle. Uh, Whoa! Just, uh, just some new, new stuff. Ha! Huh, that sounds great. Was that stuff that you were taking the opportunity that you were going back to it that then you had the idea to add them in, or were there things that you had wanted to add potentially for a while? No, they were just things, new things for the new remake. Gotcha, gotcha, and that's coming to. Tablet and PC? Mm -hmm. And Mac. Okay. And Mac, gotcha. Uh, consoles. The Walking Dead games do pretty well, consoles. If your new games end up doing well on PC, tablet, and Mac, do you think you might want to look into Xbox One, PS4, Wii U, that sort of thing, 3DS? There's all these things out there that you might find a home on. Yeah, maybe. Um, you know, we'll see how Mobius does. If it looks like it's doing really well and, you know, there's a good reason to port it. Um, it'd be fun to try something like that. Sure, sure, sure. See what the response is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so hard to say. There's a, a series on the 3DS called Ace Attorney. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Mm -mm. It's about a cute lawyer and his cute lawyer friends solving pretty <laughs> grisly murders. Like, they'll be like, it's made in Japan, so there's a certain aesthetic to it. I wouldn't say it's like typical anime, but it's very colorful. Bright blue suit and bright yellow dress the women are wearing. And they're hopping around to college. They're all happy. They're like, oh no, teacher's killed! And then just on the <laughs> stage is a dead woman who's been like tied up. They're like, we gotta solve this mystery! And uh, it's hugely, hugely popular on the 3DS. Made, uh, wow. made Capcom a lot of money. And it's very much a point and clicker. Even, it's a little bit of aspects of... Uh, Object finding, actually. You go to Mintz, poke around for evidence, uh, have a little bit of dialogue, then go back to the courtroom, have to present it at the right time at the right person. You have to watch the animations of the person who's talking for a time when you think they're insecure, and then like present the evidence that'll like make them break the fallacy of the statement they were telling, and then catch them in a lie and that sort of stuff. So well, it seems yeah. like something you might like a little. Yeah. It's not well written enough for you, though. It's just not... Like, you would read it and be like, uh, oh, jeez, it's like something I would have done when I was a kid. Like, by, by your standards, I'm sure it'd be. I don't know. You wouldn't believe the stuff I read. <laughs> really? I'm so curious about that. Uh, yeah, and what do you, uh, a parallel to what you're doing, I see, is kind of how Twilight, I don't know how you felt about Twilight, but that was another thing. I love the books. Well, yeah? I didn't like the second one because it was, yeah, anyway. <laughs> You like the books in general, sounds like. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. A, that's a nice thing to say. I did. But there was a huge backlash towards Twilight as well. It was like, how dare they take our werewolves and vampires, these kind of um, symbols of um, horror male power fantasy, and turn it into something that women can like. Another time when, uh, as a guy, if I say I like Twilight, I'll get a real yeah. like anger and, and hostility. Um, I'm, that seems I'm to dabbling. be more around the movies than necessarily the original books. I That's think, true. You think? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think, I think it's the you know it's just it's so romantic and that that you know 
makes mm. guys cringe, you know, I think. <laughs> what a shame. And I'm so curious about the love interest of Mobius. And we're almost out of time. Is there any hint you can... Because you were so elusive about that. I didn't that. say love interest, did I? No, you did not. That's true. That was me trying to be tricky. <laughs> you're, too, you're too smart for me, Jane Jensen. But that's uh, that should go without saying. So people can follow you on Twitter. You're at Jensen underscore Jane. Uh, they can find out about all the things you're working on. Pinkerton Road has its own website too. Is that right? Yeah. And there's a, a, a website for Mobius called MobiusTheGame.com. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a new trailer up there. So oh, you can cool. Check that out. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be spreading that around. Um... And I think I think we're out of time. That's why I started plugging you already. Me, I'm at <laughs> Tron Knots on Twitter, and you can watch the show later on Destructoids uh, YouTube channel, uh, Detoid on YouTube. All the reruns should be up there. We're heading towards episode 100. I think this is episode 98 already. Good grief! Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love talking to people that are fun like you. So thank you. Uh, you can also listen to it later on. Oh, my pleasure. And on iTunes, if you just want to, you know, hit the treadmill and listen to Jane Jensen, you can download this uh, on iTunes for your thing that plays sounds and enjoy that. Hold on to that forever. Oh, I'm sad it's over, Jane, but it was such a pleasure. Thank you thank for talking you. to me. For thank so you. It was fun talking to you. Oh yeah, my my pleasure. Now Conrad ends the show. But then, I mean, Sinistar ends the show, but then we can talk a little bit afterwards, so don't run away yet. That's okay. I okay. just want to say goodbye. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.